The purpose of this WDSE WRPT six episode series, Opioids Crisis in the Northland, is to start a conversation. Opioids have long been a problem. It's only recently it's been called a crisis. In this series, we will trace the epidemic, tell stories of addiction, discuss treatment, assess law and addiction, seek accountability for the crisis, and address solutions. We'd like to explore the roots of use and abuse, especially in the Northland. My son, uh, Ben, um, died of an overdose in 2016. I would say probably the first 15 years I worked here, uh, we rarely, uh, rarely uh, saw opioid overdoses that required uh, naloxone. And now we see it regularly. Uh, over again, I would say probably the past five years, Truly, uh, I, I believe this is the public health crisis of my lifetime, you know, not just because of Ben, but because of what we see, you know, day to day in the emergency department or, you know, down the road at CADT. You know, that sense of isolation and um, stoic rural northern Minnesota, the ability to be able to reach out and to share or to say I'm in trouble or um, I need some help like that, that is not something that has ever come easy. There are many reasons people misuse opioids, but Dr. Elizabeth Bilden, an Essentia toxicologist, believes it isn't simply a choice, it's an illness. Why do people use drugs? Again, multiple reasons. For folks who have a, so some folks use it recre, from a recreational standpoint and don't have any trouble with their job, their school, whatever's going on. So some people are using it, again, recreational use, but folks with a substance use disorder, the, the cause is the same here as it is in other parts of the world. There's an addiction, it's an underlying illness, and what, who's at risk for that? Trauma, young age of starting some of those other substances that you talked about, alcohol still being the biggest problem in our country. So it's an underlying illness, again, that's used despite the consequences. Marsha Gurno is with ORS, the Opioid Abuse Response Strategies Workgroup, whose mission is to create community-based solutions for victims of substance abuse disorders. For opioids, the death is directly related to the opioid overdose and, it's, and it, it, it's taking young people at a rate greater than alcohol or any other substance is killing our young people or motor vehicle accidents, according to the CDC. So opioids are killing our um, sons, daughters, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters at a rate um, totally never um, seen before, so at historical proportions in St. Louis County is one of the highest in the state for overdose deaths related to opioids. Dr. Heather Blue is an assistant professor of clinical pharmacy at UMD. We asked Dr. Blue why she thinks the opioid epidemic is in the spotlight now when it has been a long-standing problem. There have been different groups that have been dealing with um, addiction and mental health concerns um, for a long time. And then as it moves through the socioeconomic classes, um, it's, it's getting more awareness, um, which it should. It should have had awareness the whole time. But we're definitely seeing um, as it's affecting um, more wealthy families, um, I think it's also putting a different face on drug misuse and the fact that you know, it's people have this stigma that it's someone, um, opioid use is someone sitting in an alley um, injecting. And that's, we know that's not true. Um, it probably has never been true, but it's um, now we're seeing it more. You know, it is, it's the professional that's slipping medications at work. And, um, you know, people that are able to misuse their prescribed medications, um, they're people that are going to multiple physicians and getting prescriptions. Um, they're misusing it um, and they have addiction and they're trying to prevent withdrawal. 
Um, so I think it, it's showing us a whole different view of what addiction is and, and really focusing and hopefully um, really engaging people to look at addiction as a disease uh, that doesn't have socioeconomic classes or um, different ethnicities. It's really just a disease that can affect everyone. I uh, went to school for you know, chemical dependency and you know, some other stuff, and so I did my internship at Minnesota Teen Challenge. Back in 2009, 10. Um, and so I was doing my internship in the outpatient program. I, most of the people who I worked with used pills. And so was oxys a lot, lower tabs. Um, so we heard a lot about that. Um, I am not sure when they had, you know, within that time period, probably in between 2009 and 2011, 12, if I can remember correctly, I think the government came down on doctors. Like, do not prescribe all these pills. Stop oxys and lower taps and all that stuff because people are getting addicted to them. Man. And so when that subsided, the Opanas came on the scene like huge. In Duluth, I mean, you know, they were crushing them, they were smoking them, injecting them, to, you know, ingesting them. I mean, anything that they could do to get them in their system. Um, and most of the people who I worked with were addicted to the Opana pills, the opioids. So um, soon after that, uh, there was a big drug bust in town here. Um, I, it might have been like four or 5,000 pills maybe, uh, but, you know, but you know, five or six people were arrested. They might still be in jail today. And that took most of the old panas up the street. And then when that happened, heroin got introduced in a very big way. Um, I do know uh, personally about 20 people, kids under 18 years old, who died um, in between 2010 and 2014. And you know, you would not read in the paper or hear anything like that because they're under the age of 18. Duluth Police Lieutenant Jeff Kazel, commander of Lake Superior Drug and Violent Crime Task Force, saw Duluth's first sizable heroin bust in the early 2000s. It was 2013 when we, uh, we seized our, our first big amount. It was a, a thousand gram amount, a kilo. So um, I, I would say 2013 would be the, the big eye-opening moment for, for around here. There are a lot of people doing crack cocaine as well, okay? And crack cocaine was a major epidemic, especially in the African-American community and the marginalized communities. The epidemic of, you know, the heroin came on the scene. Um, a lot of rich kids were dying. A lot of maybe people who were, had a great reputation on the political scene or whatever. You know, most of their kids are just, overdosing, dying, and, and then now it became a public health and safety issue. It was, let's get help for people who are addicted to opioids. And that, and um, <clears throat> it's needed, of course. It's needed, and, but it was needed a long time ago. Representative David Baker of the Minnesota House of Representatives drove hundreds of miles to Duluth to be part of this conversation. He lost his son, Daniel, in 2011 to an overdose and works on legislation to combat the epidemic. And the one thing that I, I, I guess, if there's gonna possibly be a good side to this opioid epidemic, is it brought addiction to a, the forefront in what in the heck is addiction? Um, and so it, it, this, this form of addiction was then happening to a class of people that it wasn't supposed to happen to. And it made a lot of us wake up finally and say, um, this is a disease, this has to be treated differently. This isn't just junkies or people that are always choosing to look for uh, the next high. Like my son, many other people, uh, he was injured in a, in a softball accident and a, just a back pain. Doctor gave him pain pills and my son at about 20 years old found his first aha moment when he took the first pill. Sue Purchase grew up in Cloquet and is a harm reduction consultant. 
She is a pioneer in the needle exchange movement. We're, we're talking about the mid-90s on, and certainly that was part of my experience and what I saw um, running Women with a Point or Access Works, the needle exchange harm reduction program in Minneapolis. We started in 1996, and um, we didn't start off seeing pills immediately, but it wasn't long before they were part of the scene. You know, pill usage and, and the opioid crisis as it related to prescription drugs, how quickly Minnesota was to um, have more of a problem related to pills. Uh, but certainly by, you know, 2000, without a doubt, uh, we were starting to hear and see more related to pill use, and um, by 2007, 2006, when I came back to Minneapolis after being in the Northwest for a few years, I was absolutely stunned by, um, well, Access Works had, had a lot of participants. The number had certainly increased and a lot of them were young users coming from the suburbs who had started in their parents' medicine cabinet and uh, experimenting. And um, I don't think with any real knowledge about what they were experimenting with other than getting high. And then they would end up at the needle exchange and looking for other sources, you know, whether it was um, oftentimes heroin or, you know, some other access. So it really, I, I think that um, we watched it unfold from the very beginning. It's not a surprise. It's, it, it isn't the crisis all of a sudden. People are dying. People close to them are dying. It's not a random, strung out uh, junkie in South Minneapolis anymore. It's happening in Cloquet, it's happening in Duluth, it's happening on the Iron Range, and people can't ignore it. County Attorney Mark Rubin serves Minnesota's largest county in size, St. Louis County, and reminds us how opioids have touched all of us. Actually, a friend of mine who was convicted and uh, caught using, and, and it, it really does jar one's perception St. Louis County has the highest opioid overdose death rate in Minnesota, according to the University of Minnesota. We asked why it is so bad in the Northland. There are probably a number of factors that contribute to it. Um, one is uh, uh, St. Louis County is a rather impoverished county. Uh, I think that we, we know that the per capita uh, overdose uh, death by overdose rate is much higher in the Native American community, and uh, many of our uh, population is Native American. So this is a this is an epidemic that has uh, hit the Native American community really, really hard. Um, I think that those two factors are probably part of it. I think it's multifactorial. There's lots of different things going on. Maybe it is our prescribers, maybe it's our population. Um, I don't know. I don't think anyone's been able to really say why here. We also know that uh, prescribing patterns uh, affect opioid use, or at least they have in this crisis. And I think it is the case that in St. Louis County, uh, we were uh, prescribing opioids at a much higher rate than other counties in the state. I think that's, that's actually a, um, also likely a contributor. And the, it's unclear exactly why there was that prescribing pattern, but I think it, it is the case that, you know, we as physicians also uh, in doing that, and again, I'm talking several years ago, uh, likely contributed to this current crisis to some extent as well. Dr. Amanda Klein is an assistant professor at UMD's College of Pharmacy. Dr. Klein's students, future pharmacists and physicians, seek answers to addiction, withdrawal, and the fundamentals of pain. There's just a general interest, general inquiry that I get really fairly regularly uh, because somebody has known somebody. 
um, that has struggled with abuse or addiction or has had um, uh, opiate with or opiate overdose um, and that's affected them personally and so they try to you know I think seek out um, scientists for better answers and unfortunately we don't have a lot of the answers right now and that's the reason why uh, we think that this research is important so that we can develop these new therapies for people in the future. It's a problem that needs to be addressed at all levels. I mean, so I'm, I'm I, I call myself, I'm like, I'm like down here in the trenches, you know, trying to figure out how the nervous system works and how it doesn't work after we've um, been taking these drugs for so long and what happens when we stop taking these drugs and what's the consequences of that. And we spend a lot of our time talking about opioids. Uh, in our course because it is very, very important and it, because they will run across uh, individuals that are on these medications and individuals that want to get off of these medications and so we feel like it's a very important um, topic that we need to discuss and the students need to know by the time they become pharmacists. Opiates are, or opioids are actually naturally occurring compounds. Um, they exist in nature and they can be extracted from uh, plants like, like the poppy plant um, and they have pain relieving and euphoric properties uh, and so in your body you have receptors that will recognize these molecules and these receptors are called opioid receptors uh, many people are very familiar with the mu opiate receptor or the morphine receptor that's how it got its name uh, the mu opiate receptor um, is in your brain is in your spinal cord and it's in your peripheral nervous system. Uh, and so when you take morphine or related compound for pain relief, uh, it will act all over the nervous system to sort of dampen and quiet um, your nervous system activity so you don't feel the pain anymore. Opioids as a medication are an important tool and we use them every day, uh, but they need to be used for the right patient population and for that patient population they're the best medication you know so people with uh, painful cancers people with uh, severe injuries you know they still need an opioid and should have an opioid um, but that's not what we were seeing we were seeing this uh, this large and increasing population of what appeared to be young healthy people with minimal injuries who were back repetitively looking for specifically opioids, and that's when we knew we had a problem. To understand this epidemic across our nation and here in the Northland, we must identify the roots of opioid use and abuse. I think that uh, prescribing pattern likely started to ramp up in the uh, mid to late 90s, um, it, and I think it, it got to a point where it basically plateaued and we were seeing kind of the end of that. But we, you know, as we know, um, I, I think our patients, uh, many of whom developed opioid use disorders, they needed more and so came to the emergency department more, came to the clinic more. And um, uh, it wasn't until, uh, and again, physicians, I think, in practice were seeing this as a problem many years ago. Um, now, at that time, it was all prescriptions, meaning it was prescription pills primarily that was being used. There was no heroin around, there was no fentanyl around. You got to go back into like 19, uh, mid 1990s when um, the pharmaceutical companies started introducing uh, the, like Oxycontin. Um, it's a, a synthetic opioid. So when you talk about opioids, you, you have naturally occurring opioids like yourself and myself. We, we have opioids in our body right now, whether you believe it or not, but endorphins are opioids because they all attach to the opioid receptors in your body. And that's your body's way of dealing with pain and, and different situations that, that it needs to, to do that, and, and your body does that for you. So you have those, those receptors naturally in your body. But when you start introducing outside opioids, like the, the naturally occurring ones from the poppy plant that you know, produces opium, and when it's refined, it can be refined into morphine. And if it's refined even more, it can be refined into heroin. Then you get into like the synthetics, like I was saying, it's all made in a, in a lab, in a pharmaceutical lab, where they, again, they're built to attach themselves to that opioid receptor, and through chemicals, they're able to do that. So, 
lots of different things, but heroin's an opioid, the pill that you get from, uh, the pain pill that you get from your uh, doctor's prescription, opioid, same thing. In 1910, the Flexner Report was published, laying out a medical education manual and standardizing ethical responsibility. Uh, Chinese laborers brought opium over in the 1850s. Uh, they were uh, morphine and opi opium was contained in tonics and elixirs and available in drugstores um, throughout the 19th century. And that's really during a time when there was no FDA, there was no standardized uh, testing for drugs. You know, we were using opioids for lots of things. Um, some of the antique and the, I think the coolest bottles to find um, and advertisement was to give opium to infants, so colicky babies, um, to help them, to help soothe them, uh, which now I think in, in the face of this epidemic is, is crazy to think about, but we didn't know, it, and it does do that. It mellows, um, you know, it can calm them down. They won't cry as much, um, unfortunately. There can be severe problems with using it, but um, opioids have been used for a long time in lots of different ways. Um, we're just now starting to realize their full impact. Opioid experts say overprescribing led to dependency and misuse. Subsequent prescription restrictions spiked illicit drug use and caused a surge in synthetics like fentanyl, causing increased overdoses. This is a multifactorial sort of the perfect storm. Folks have addiction, initially increased dist well, going way back is there was a problem. That's why we have a, a law in 1914 that limited the distribution who could prescribe opioids. It's been a problem for a long time. And decreasing distribution is what the healthcare systems are, are doing. The number of prescriptions in, this, in the United States, and we follow here in Duluth, follow, I can speak to Essentia, um, the same trend. The number of prescriptions have actually decreased since 2010 even before the CDC guidelines came out. So folks are trying, but then you have, again, adding this increase, the responsibility to treat pain. According to the DEA, fentanyl is 80 to 100 times stronger than morphine. Fentanyl has become a lethal problem for emergency rooms and law enforcement. So what, what seems to happen is there will be Kind of, it'll be quiet for a while, and then there will be a new batch uh, in town. And there has been, you know, kind of this recent uh, change from heroin to fentanyl. So there's way more fentanyl in the community, and fentanyl is a, it's just a very, very, very potent opioid. And so people who are used to using one uh, from one supplier, then they use the same dose the next time, and if it's contaminated with fentanyl. Um, it, it's way too much, and so then they stop. And that's what opioid overdose, what it does is it, it shuts off your breathing. You stop breathing, and there are, there are not that many medicines that do that. It's potentiated by taking uh, benzodiazepines like Valium or alcohol. According to the CDC, in 2016, the number of overdose deaths involving opioids was five times higher than 1999. On average, 115 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose. And from 1999 to 2016, we have lost more than 350,000 lives. We only have about 3.6% of the state's population, and we have over 5% of the opioid-related deaths. So that's it's a lot statistically. It didn't have to happen to our family, and it didn't have to happen to a thousand other families right here in Minnesota. I miss you know, been every day. And yet, you know, this is, um, this is my, you know, attempting to make his life mean something. In the next episode, we'll be discussing addiction, or substance use disorder as we've come to understand it. Stories of loved ones, those who have been lost, and what we can do. I've been an addict most of my adult life.
I guess how I became addicted to them. I never really cared for pills or anything, and that's kind of how everybody builds up to it. I got a prescription for Oxys when I was, I want to say 23, after a car accident, and I learned that you could smoke them, and I, I never knew that was a thing, and I tried it, and I liked it, and opiate addiction is so much different than other addictions I've had in my life. It was, you know, I dabbled with stuff and then became a meth addict and stuck with that. That was easy to walk away from. The first time I tried an opiate, I wanted to do it every day for the rest of my life and just, then you're physically addicted to it and the withdrawal is so horrible that you just don't want to stop. And if you want to know what resources are available to you, out of St. Louis County, there's the Opioid Abuse Response Strategies Team, ORS. We'll be sharing more about them throughout this documentary.